Hello, sorry about the delay. Um, a slight problem with a uh, slight technical issue. Um, welcome to the first IEA Clean Call Centre webinar that is live in the Asia Pacific region, or Eastern Australian Eastern Standard Time to be precise. My name is Carl Nickel, and today's webinar is called Developments in Oxy Combustion Technologies and will be pre presented by my colleague Toby Lockwood. This report is currently in draft and will be published next month. After Toby's presentation, I will give a short review on the use of high temperature materials in pulverized coal technology. If you have any questions during the webinar, or indeed any comments, please click the question button at the top of your screen, type in the question, and we will answer them at the end. First of all, the IEA Clean Coal Centre is a non-profit organisation which disseminates impartial information on the clean and efficient use of coal worldwide. Currently, the centre has 21 members made up of member countries and sponsoring organisations. Most, but not all, of the member countries are members of the OECD. The majority of the sponsor organisations are from non-OECD countries. The sponsors include utilities, coal companies, equipment and service suppliers and research organisations. The centre's core product is in-depth, unbiased topical reports. Members of the centre select the sub subjects to be reviewed at the twice yearly executive committee meetings. Reports cover aspects of the entire coal chain, from mining to environmental effects and policy, but concentrate on power generation and clean coal technologies. Members receive draft copies of reports and have the opportunity to comment on and contribute to the work prior to publication. Usually, 17 reports are published each year. A list of recently completed reports is available on the Centre's website. A 30 to 45 minute webinar is presented every month on recently completed reports. Webinars can be viewed live or, rec or recorded through the Centre's website. A number of databases and information facilities are operated by the Centre, which include coal meetings, clean coal technologies, coal online and emission standards. The expert staff are available for consultancy and to give presentations if requested by members. Just a reminder that residents of member countries such as Australia or employees of sponsoring organisations can register on our website and gain free access to the centre's products and services. The Centre organises five series of international workshops on the following topics mercury emissions, co firing biomass with coal, underground coal gasification, upgrading and efficiency improvements in coal fired power plant, and advanced ultra supercritical coal fired power plant. Details of the next workshops are on this slide. Workshops last 10 days and are combined with a workshop dinner and a site visit. The next Biannual International Conference on Clean Coal Technologies, which runs for three days, will be in 2015. These dissemination events attract experts globally. They have up to 100 delegates and therefore provide a valuable networking opportunity. As the centre is a non-profit or making organisation, our registration fees are low. So, over to you, Toby. Thanks, Carl. Um, as Carl said, this webinar is a summary of a report which will shortly be available on our website in a draft form, and comments are welcome for that. Uh, the report provides a broad review of the state of the art in each of the technologies involved in oxyfuel coal plant, and this presentation will briefly highlight some of the key points discussed. 
An oxy-fuel carbon capture fuel is fired in a mixture of oxygen and recycled flue gases in order to produce a relatively pure stream of CO2 which can be captured without use of solvents, effectively eliminating the nitrogen from combustion. Oxy-fuel flue gases instead consist primarily of CO2 and water, which is easily removed by a condensation step. An oxy-fuel coal plant is therefore made up of a conventional plant with the addition of an air separation unit, or ASU, for production of the oxygen, a CO2 compression and purification unit, or CPU, and the facility for recycling flue gas back to the boiler. A principal advantage of oxy-fuel over other capture technologies is that it makes use of commercial gas processing technologies in the ASU and CPU, which can be relatively easily added to a coal plant. Together with the advantage of minimal interference with the steam cycle, this means oxyfuel is often considered as particularly suitable for retrofit applications. As flue gas volumes are usually lower than in conventional plants, there is also potential for easier pollution control and reduced equipment size. However, like all CCS technologies, oxyfuel still imposes a significant efficiency penalty on the plant due to the energy intensive air separation and CO2 compression processes. Introducing recycled flue gases to the boiler also has a complex effect on combustion, heat transfer and corrosion mechanisms in the boiler, which require thorough understanding. A fundamental parameter in design of an oxyfuel plant is the choice of where flue gases are recycled from and in what proportion. Taking flue gases before they are cooled in a wet flue gas desulfurization unit has an efficiency advantage, but also carries the risk of concentrating corrosive SOC species in the boiler. Recycle of gases further cooled in the flue gas condenser imposes an even higher energy penalty, but is useful as a dry stream to replace the primary air used for coal transport and drying. A common approach is therefore to take a dry primary cycle stream from after the flue gas condenser and a wet secondary stream from before or after the FGD, depending on sulphur levels. In this respect, dry desulphurization technologies could prove to be a useful compromise for some coal types. CO2 differs from nitrogen in a number of combustion-relevant properties. Most importantly, a high specific heat capacity has the effect of lowering flame temperature and retarding the combustion reaction, generally leading to a less stable flame with a large ignition delay. Other factors include the introduction of thermal radiation from both CO2 and H2O, a reduced diffusivity of reactants, and the involvement of gasification reactions between both gases and the solid charge. Adjusting the proportion of recycled flue gas or the recycle ratio is the first recourse to stabilising an oxyfuel flame and achieving heat transfer characteristics which are similar to air firing. Lowering the recycle ratio to give higher than air levels of oxygen of around 27 to 28% is found to be necessary to produce air like flame temperatures and ignition delay. An appropriate recycle ratio also needs to account for the effect of increased radiation from CO2, which may require slightly lower furnace temperatures and the need to retain sufficient flue gas heat for heat duty in the convective path. However, fully optimised combustion performance requires tailor-made oxyfuel burners, of which numerous examples have now been produced by manufacturers. These generally aim to promote ignition close to the burner, either by injection of pure oxygen through oxygen lances, or encouraging recirculation of hot exhaust through swirl or altered coil geometries. Aerodynamic effects of the burner need to take into account gas densities and volumes which are significantly altered from air firing. NOx formation rates are substantially lower in oxyfuel combustion due to the elimination of thermal NOx and more importantly the reburning of recycled NO in the furnace. SOX formation can also be reduced as the higher concentrations of SOX favour greater sulphur retention ash. Regardless of formation rates, flue gas recycle has the effect of concentrating these contaminants by up to four times in the boiler. Although in the absence of true stack emissions, this is primarily concerned for corrosion and, and demand on the CO2 purification process. Concentrated levels of both SOX and water vapour lead to an increase in acid dew point by up to 30 degrees and a much greater risk of severe acid corrosion in cooler regions of the boiler and flue gas ducts. Areas at risk include the gas preheater, economizer, FGD, and downstream processes in which condensation necessarily occurs as part of the CO2 purification. 
As a consequence, corrosion-resistant stainless steels or protective coatings are often used for these parts of the plant. Regions of ductwork which are cooled by stagnation or air ingress can also be protected by improving sealing and introducing gas purge lines. The effect of the oxyfuel atmosphere on the high temperature corrosion of superheater and water wall materials is much more complex and has proved difficult to accurately assess. High levels of sulphur in the boiler are expected to lead to increased corrosion by sulfidation as well as exacerbating hot corrosion by molten sulphate salts. High levels of carbon dioxide could also result in damaging carburisation of the alloys, although in practice this appears to be effectively mitigated by oxidising conditions in the boiler. Several lab studies have shown worse corrosion in oxyfuel atmospheres, particularly with martensitic steels, but pilot scale tests are less conclusive and there is little agreement on the extent of the influence. While the underlying corrosion mechanisms appear similar to air firing, further research is needed to determine a safe range of operating conditions for oxyfuel. For example, the stabilising effect of a high sulphur atmosphere on molten sulphates has been found to shift peak hot corrosion rates to higher temperatures than in air. Cryogenic air separation, in which air is compressed and cooled to its dew point before distillation into oxygen and nitrogen, is the only commercially available technology for the production of oxygen on the scale required by an oxyfuel plant. With a consumption of around 20 tonnes of oxygen per net megawatt, the standard plant will actually require around two of the largest air separation units currently available. Although relatively impure oxygen can be used, the process is highly energy intensive, consuming from 10 to 15 percent of a plant's growth output and representing the largest parasitic load on the plant. ASU may also limit plant flexibility as compressors have limited turn down and cooling the cryogenic equipment from a warm start can take several days. As the energy consumed by current ASU is over three times the theoretical separation energy of oxygen, there exists ample scope for optimising the energy efficiency of the process. Significant gains over the last decade have largely been achieved by developing more complex distillation process cycles such as the three column process which provide more efficient heat exchange and reduce the air pressures required for the separation. Technological developments such as more efficient compressors and heat exchangers are also ongoing, and further reduction in energy consumption to 140 kilowatt hours per tonne of oxygen is targeted in the next few years. The ability to store some of the oxygen produced by the ASU as a liquid would allow for a useful means of offsetting ASU operating costs that can be used as a substitute for running the unit when energy prices are high and then cheaply replenished when energy prices are low. Liquid oxygen storage also helps to improve ASU flexibility by enabling lower turndown and faster ramp rates. Ion transport membranes are the principal candidate for an alternative means of oxygen production to cryogenic ASU. In this technology, a hot pressurised air feed is passed over perovskite ceramic membranes across which oxygen selectively diffuses to produce a pure oxygen permeate stream. The potential for efficiency gains over the cryogenic process is derived from the fact that the energy remaining in a hot air feed can be recovered in a gas turbine rather than lost in cooling. Based on modular stacks of flat membranes, the most developed version of this technology is a design from air products which has so far been tested at a scale of 5 tonnes of oxygen per day and will be further scaled up to a 100 tonne per day plant which is scheduled to start up this year. Even though oxyfuel flue gases are enriched in CO2, contamination due to air ingress, residual oxygen and conventional flue gas contaminants means that a fairly elaborate purification process is still required to produce a CO2 stream fit for sequestration. While deep dehydration to PPM levels of water is required to prevent pipeline corrosion, it is also energetically favourable to remove nitrogen and oxygen rather than compressing them to pipeline pressure with the CO2. The cryogenic condensation necessary for removal of these light gases uses sensitive compressor and heat exchange equipment which imposes its own purity requirements, including almost complete removal of SOX, NOx and mercury. The CPU operating of the large Calide oxyfuel pilot here in Australia shows a fairly typical process 
in which flue gases are compressed, dried by temperature swing absorption, and condensed against the purified CO2 products in a process known as auto-refrigeration. For NOx removal, CPU are able to exploit the fact that NO is oxidized to soluble NO2 at high pressures, so a large proportion can be removed with condensate in the compressor after coolers. Approaches to reaching PPM levels of SOX and NOx are the principal point of difference between CPU designs with low and high pressure alkali scrubs, activated carbon absorbance, and distillation of NO2 all demonstrated at CPU pilots. Notably, the sour compression process developed by Air Products avoids use of alkali reagents by exploiting the NO catalyzed conversion of SO2 to soluble SO3 at high pressures. The partial condensation of flue gases typically captures around 90% of the CO2, but a further purification step can be implemented to separate CO2 and oxygen from these vented gases and return them to the CPU and boiler respectively. Polymer membranes or pressure swing absorption have been used for this step, which increases capture rates to over 98% and reduces the demand on the ASG. Increasing the capture rate in this way has the benefit of lowering the capture cost per tonne of CO2. A key strategy for improving the efficiency of an oxyfuel plant is to achieve a high level of thermal integration between the steam cycle and the additional ASU and CPU processes. Heat generated by air compression in the ASU is usually lost to cooling water, but could instead be recovered for heating boiler feed water, replacing steam extraction and gaining up to 0.4 percentage points in efficiency for the plant. Advanced heat exchanges are needed to optimize heat transfer across the small temperature difference with a minimum pressure drop and an efficient adiabatic compression step to maximize air temperatures is also favored. A similar strategy with smaller gains could be applied to compressors in the CPU, and conversely, low pressure steam can be used for efficient regeneration of the drying sorbents used in both processes. Oxyfuel research at the pilot scale is relatively capital intensive, as unlike the power plant slipstream tests available to post combustion capture, a new or retrofitted oxyfuel boiler is also required. Nevertheless, steady scale up over the last 20 years has resulted in the construction of a number of large pilot units of over 20 megawatts thermal in size. The commissioning of Vattenfall's 30 megawatt thermal oxyfuel pilot at Schwarzer Pumper Power Plant in 2008 represents a key landmark in oxyfuel technology as the then largest and first full chain process including ASU and CPU. The pilot continues to operate successfully in both air and oxyfuel mode, capturing up to 9 tonnes of liquid CO2 per day. Numerous test campaigns have been carried out at the plant, including installation of a range of burner designs, corrosion and materials testing, operation of wet FGD in oxyfuel conditions, and dynamic control of each of the plant processes. Ciudad de la Energía, or CIUDIN, is a Spanish government-funded carbon capture research institute whose principal research activity is centered on two oxyfuel boilers commissioned in 2011 and 2012. Of particular interest is a 30 megawatt thermal circulating fluidized bed boiler designed by Foster Wheeler, which is the largest oxyfuel CFB operating. CFB combustion may offer a number of advantages for oxyfuel, including the option of using higher levels of oxygen and thus reducing flue gas recycling equipment size, and the Ciudan unit has been tested up to 40% oxygen. Other tests have studied the effects of the oxyfuel atmosphere on bed agglomeration and the chemistry of in-furnace desulfurization with the limestone as well as the dynamic integration of the boiler and CPU. The current pace setter for oxyfuel pilot testing is found here in Australia at the Calli Day power plant in Queensland, where a 100 megawatt thermal unit has been commissioned by a consortium of companies with support from the governments of Australia, Japan and Queensland. Besides being by far the largest oxyfuel unit operational, the plant is notable for being the first boiler retrofit and the first to generate electricity to the grid. Furthermore, the lack of FGD in the plant means that the CPU is obliged to deal with relatively high concentrations of SOX and flue gas. Successful commissioning of this plant in 2012 has been followed by improvements in management of corrosion, sealing, and plant process logic, and test campaigns will include high temperature corrosion studies and the effect of varying CO2 concentration on the CPU.
Well, the number of oxyfuel projects for demonstration scale have reached advanced stages of planning. Like all large CCS projects, they've been hindered by lack of sufficient political and financial support. The 167 megawatt Future Gen 2 project from the USA currently looks best placed to become the first oxyfuel demonstration plant, having recently completed a detailed feed study and secured $1 billion in support from the US government. Comprising an oxyfuel retrofit of a unit at the Maridocia power plant in Illinois, the project has sought to reduce costs rather than maximise efficiency and would generate 100 megawatts in net power output to the grid. A high capture rate CPU would feed the 1.1 million tonnes per year of captured CO2 to a pipeline travelling 50 kilometres to an onshore saline aquifer storage site. This plant could commence construction phase as early as this year. Other significant demonstrations proposed in the last few years include Indessa's 300 megawatt Compostia project based on the oxyfuel CFB technology being tested by Foster Wheeler at Sudan and a 100 megawatt retrofit project in Korea. Unfortunately, both these projects appear to be currently stalled due to lack of funding. Potentially more promising is the 450 megawatt White Rose project proposed for Jack's power station in the UK, which has recently commenced a feed study and is one of two finalists for £1 billion of CCS funding from the UK government. Activity is also growing in China, where a large 35 megawatt thermal pilot is nearing completion at the Huangzhou University of Science and Technology a number of demonstration projects are proposed. Many second generation oxyfuel concepts are based on pressurised combustion, which is seen as particularly suitable for oxyfuel for several reasons. Primarily, a large portion of useful heat can be recovered from the flue gas water vapour by use of condensing heat exchanger at pressure, and the energy required for oxygen compression is mitigated by reduction in CO2 compression demand downstream. Air ingress to the boiler would also be significantly reduced. The most developed pressurised process have been tested by NL on the 5 megawatt thermal scale since 2007, and a feasibility study for a demonstration plant based on this technology has been completed. Like many pressurised concepts, this technology uses a cold slurry feed, and also a unique high temperature flameless combustion process has the additional benefit of reduced socks, knocks, and flourish formation. This technology is one of a number of advanced pressure, pressurised concepts which are currently supported by a US Department of Energy research programme. The principal additional capital cost in an oxyfuel power plant is the ASU, which is estimated to comprise from 15 to 20 percent of the total plant cost and is correlated to some extent with the efficiency performance of the unit. However, most analyses of carbon capture technologies suggest that oxyfuel costs are broadly competitive with the post-combustion capture for a new plant, with up to 80% increase in cost of electricity over a conventional plant, and could be more economical for a retrofit scenario. Given the successful operation of several industrial-scale pilots, there is a widespread consensus that there are no technological barriers to advancing oxyfuel capture to a demonstration phase. Achieving air-like combustion and the heat transfer behaviour at the pilot scale has become fairly well established, although ongoing research aims to ensure a reliable scale-up to a full-scale plant. The risk of accelerated corrosion under certain oxygen conditions is perhaps the biggest challenge faced by the technology, and is also the subject to considerable research effort. However, at worst, the corrosion risk may limit the fuel flexibility and recycle path options of future plant or forerunner projects. Optimising energy intensive air separation and CO2 purification processes is key to maximising the competitivity of oxygen as a carbon capture option. The energy efficiency of cryogenic ASU has been steadily improved to meet the demands of oxygen plant and further optimisation is expected. Highly efficient storage of liquid oxygen is also a significant new technology for improving plant flexibility and economics. More limited by an inherent compression energy demand, the CPU offers less opportunity for efficiency gains, but instead offers scope for more economical removal of conventional pollutants on the high pressure, smaller volume flue gas stream passing through unit, and the number of new technologies have been developed to this end. Estimates for the minimum efficiency penalty achievable for an oxyfuel process can be as low as 6 percentage points, representing a fully optimised plant with a high level of thermal integration between the steam cycle and the gas processing units. 
Further optimization associated with second generation technologies could include the use of pressurized combustion systems and ion transport membranes for oxygen production. While capital operating costs for an initial first of the kind demonstration plant are likely to be substantial, experience has shown that costs will reduce rapidly with successive deployment. However, for any carbon abatement technology to succeed, long term political backing is required to encourage the necessary investment. And I'd like to end the talk there. So I'll hand back over to Carl. I don't know if we're seeing if we have some questions now or no, we'll leave questions until after I've done a short presentation on materials. So, um, yeah, please ask questions using the button, button at the top of your screen. Um, and I will give a short review of high temperature materials in pulverised coal fired power plant. I have already presented two webinars on high temperature materials. The first one is called Status of Advanced Ultra Supercritical Pulverised Coal Technology and the other is called High Temperature Steels in Pulverised Coal Technology. Um, both can be watched and um, recorded through the Centre's website. To introduce, um, pulverised coal-fired power plants account for 95%, if not more, of the global fleet of coal-fired power plants. Um, as shown by this figure, raising the ma maximum steam temperature increases electrical efficiency. However, the steam temperature is limited by materials that can withstand damage mechanisms at such temperatures for a service lifetime of up to 40 to 50 years. And just to note that all, all the temperatures that I mention um, are that of the steam, not of the metal or the flame. With over 130 years of development, ferritic steels are well proven, easy to work with, low cost and have reached, seem to have reached their limits at 565 degrees Celsius. Invented in the 1960s, Martin Citic steels are now extensively used to achieve state-of-the-art steam temperatures with 600 degrees Celsius attainable with high pressure steam and 620 degrees Celsius attainable with lower pressure steam. Generally, Martin Citic steels are excellent high temperature materials. Despite unsuccessful deployments of austenitic steels in the 1960s, they have been used effectively in superheater and reheater applications since the 1990s. They are limited to thin section applications because of a high coefficient of thermal expansion. Austenitic steels and Martin Citic steels have higher cost than ferritic steels due to the increased amount of alloy and the requirement for post weld heat treatment. If pulverised coal plants are operated in cyclic operation beyond their design specification, then there is a high chance of failure through fatigue cracks, creep fatigue crack cracks, type 4 cracking and dissimilar metal weld cracking. The figure below shows the relative lifetime decrease um, for steels with the introduction of cyclic operation. It can be economically favourable to repair or replace components before failure. Therefore, modern software packages and material examination tools can be used to project the corrected steel lifetimes accounting for cyclic operation. Newer components have improved their resistance to cyclic operation through component design so that the welds are in low stress areas, the welding procedure is easier and stronger materials are used, are used allowing thinner walls which are less sensitive to thermal expansion. This table lists materials used for high temperature boiler components in supercritical and ultra supercritical power plant with the resistance required, required to the main damage mechanisms and other comments. This is the same table for the steam turbine. These tables are here to give you an idea of the complexity involved in power plant materials. These tables can be found in my report on steels for further examination.
The orange bars on this figure illustrate the highest steam temperatures achievable for commercial steels in different high temperature applications. As shown, the limiting factor to increasing steam temperature is with steels for thick section headers and pipes. If 650 degree steels can be developed for thick section components, as displayed by the purple bars, then pulverized coal plants can operate at 650 degrees Celsius superheat and reheat steam, uh, with a corresponding rise in electrical efficiency of roughly 1 to 3%. 650 degrees Celsius steels um, are strengthened with lava's phase, Z phase and subgrain strengthening mechanisms. Uh, they are under development in Japan and in Europe with promising initial progress. As the steel barrier is estimated to be 650 degrees Celsius, the nickel alloys can be used in place of steels in the highest temperature components to reach steam temperatures of 700 degrees Celsius with efficiencies of over 50%. The location of these nickel alloys are highlighted in pink and green on this flow diagram. There are large research programs in the USA, European Union, Japan, China, India and Russia which are researching nickel alloys. Although components manufactured from nickel alloys are 5 to 43 times more expensive than using steel, it is estimated that with superheated steam at 700 degrees Celsius, and the corresponding rise in efficiency, then the use of nickel alloys becomes economically favourable. There are three stages of development spanning up to 29 years in each programme. Stage one starts off with laboratory scale chemical and mechanical tests to screen materials. Stage 2 manufactures large-scale components from candidate materials and then tests them in a slipstream components test facility for up to five years to verify performance, after which the components are removed and evaluated to qualify the materials. Stage 3 sees the build of a commercial-scale demonstration unit and operation for around five years with subsequent evaluation once again to verify performance and qualify the materials. Presently, all research programs are in stage two. The Indian program has plans to start operating the first full-scale demonstration unit in 2018. For the, other, for the other programs, results from component test facilities and long-term creep tests due by 2018 will provide enough technical information to decide progression to stage three. If all goes to plan, then a commercial scale demonstration plant will be operational in 2021. Again, up to five years operation is needed to verify, perform verify performance and subsequent evaluation to qualify the materials. Results could be ready for the year 2027, providing it takes four years to design and build a commercial scale plant then a significant fleet of advanced ultra-supercritical plants could be operational from 2031. To summarise, cycling plants beyond their design criteria can result in catastrophic failure. It may be economically favourable to predict when the existing materials may fail so that preventative action can be taken. State-of-the-art 600 degrees Celsius steels achieve up to 47% electrical efficiency. In the 2020s, next decade, 650 steels could be commercial and increase such efficiency up to 50%. And in the 2030s, in two decades, 700 degrees Celsius nickel alloys could increase such efficiency to above 50%. My final remark is that developing stronger materials has tangible benefits for electrical efficiency and the flexibility of pulverised coal-fired power plant.
So, the next Clean Coal Centre webinar will take place on Wednesday, the 14th of May, um, 24th of this year, at UK time, midday, um, where Ian Barnes will be the presenter, and his subject is Upgrading the Efficiency of the World's Coal Fleet to Reduce Carbon Dioxide Emissions. So, thank you for listening to the first IEA Clean Coal Centre webinar that is live in the Asia-Pacific region. We would appreciate it if you could rate this webinar by the rate button at the top of your screen, and, and we will now answer any questions. Um, also, the PowerPoint of this webinar will be available to download through our website um, immediately after the webinar. So, we'll wait here for any questions. Okay, we've got one question through. Um, will ion transport, this is for Toby, will ion transport membranes, membranes become or work on a commercial scale in the near future? Um, I'm sure there will be uh, progress to the commercial scale. Uh, we've got the air products, 100 tonnes per day demonstration, hopefully starting this year, and uh, I'm sure scale up of that process will continue. There's a number of other uh, processes to the research phase. Um, I don't think they'll be useful for any first generation of oxy fuel plants, but um, yeah, they seem to certainly have potential. Okay. Well, we'll wait for a few minutes to see if any more questions come through. been explained very clearly. If there are any questions after the webinar is finished, you can email um, email to us. You can, yeah, you can use our emails which are on the screen here. Um, we've got another question coming through. It says, what are the reference conditions for the no notational efficiencies stated for high temperature plant? In hot climates, for example, vacuum conditions are significant. Uh, very important question. Uh, the reference conditions are noted in the report, uh, but the main study is Compta 700, which is done by the Europeans and they've got um, reference conditions for uh, bl a black coal fired plant and a brown coal fired plant. Um, they're using North Sea cooling, which is a significant advantage. Um, and the, the efficiencies ranged from 50 to 52.63, and that was with single reheat and double reheat. But since then, because that study was conducted uh, seven years ago, uh, there have been considerable improvements in process engineering throughout coal-fired power plant. So that figure is now old, it should be updated, um, and some people think that we can get to 53%, maybe higher if, um, if the conditions are favourable, but will be lower if it is, a, it is in a hot climate. Okay, um, no more questions have been answered, um, asked, so uh, I think we'll, we'll call it. Yep. Okay, right, thank you for listening, and goodbye.